Hello everyone, welcome to Take Charge of Your Health and to another presentation where we will learn more about how to take charge of our health. Our guest speaker today is Barbara O'Neill and she will be answering some of the most debated questions about health and end time preparedness. If you want to know more about Barbara O'Neill, I've included quite an extensive biography about her in our previous presentation, What Should a Christian Wear? Welcome to the program, Barbara. Thank you so much for being with us again. It's a pleasure. It's good to be here. Thank you. I'll start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into the questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity again that we've come together to discuss very important issues about health and how they link to our salvation and how we can glorify you in our bodies. We thank you again uh, that Barbara can be with us today to discuss these important questions and answer them. We ask you all these in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I guess the most debated question, I would say, is um, the issue of cayenne pepper. I have heard other doctors say that it's just like a, another chili. It raises the temperature of the stomach, uh, so it must be bad for you. So what are your thoughts on um, cayenne pepper? And if it's so good for us, how do we make sure that we buy the real cayenne and that it's not um, tempered with? Okay, it's a good question. Now, I have a book here, and I think everyone knows the book, Back to Eden mm -hmm. by Jethro Kloss. He devotes half a page to every herb but not cane pepper. He devotes 10 pages to cane pepper. It's one of the most remarkable herbs that we have. And a lot of people get confused because Ellen White states that we shouldn't be eating spicy foods or stimulating foods. And it is true that cane pepper is a heating herb. Leviticus 17.11 states that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So anything that moves blood and moves blood a little bit faster to an area is going to increase the healing. And that's what cane pepper does. It is not a nervous system stimulant like caffeine, alcohol, nicotine. It is a blood stimulant. In fact, it is probably the one and only or the major blood stimulant. And so anywhere that cane pepper is applied, um, will increase healing to that area. And you say the stomach. Well, if someone's got low hydrochloric acid and they need to boost it, cane pepper is a wonderful booster of hydrochloric acid. And so it is not a bad thing that it heats the stomach. It is actually a good thing because it increases digestion. And it really is a myth, too much hydrochloric acid. I've, I've never met anyone with too much hydrochloric acid. Dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid that we do. And that's why they can eat rotten food and it not kill them. True. So cane pepper. I'd like to read you a little bit from Jethro Kloss. Some of the botanical names. It's, uh, its botanical name is capsicum anum. And the common name is cane pepper. Red pepper, capsicum, Spanish pepper, bird pepper, pod pepper, African pepper, um, African red pepper. So there's quite a few names for it. And a lot of people say, well, what's the distinction between uh, cayenne and chili? Mm -hmm. In some areas, it's not easy to, um, to see the distinction. But the chili comes from the chili family and the cane comes from the capsicum family. So there's a little bit of a difference there. So let me read this again or a little bit more. It is a pungent stimulant, but as I said, not a, not a nervous system stimulant. It's a tonic. It's one of the most wonderful herb medicines that we have, says Jethro Kloss. We do wonderful things with it. We're able to do it with no other herb. And in another book, it's called Curing with Cayenne by Sam Beiser. 
that's B-I-S-E-R, and I think you can get that as an e-book. He says, you put cane pepper with any other herb and it'll increase that, the uh, action of those, uh, that other herb. So cane pepper can be used internally. So let's start. It can be used to relieve a sore throat. Yes, it might tingle at first, but after the tingle has subsided, the sore throat will have eased. It can be used in the stomach to uh, help someone with nausea. It can also uh, boost hydrochloric acid, which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. When it gets into the blood, it thins the blood. So it's one of the best blood thinners. It not only thins the blood, but it causes um, a dilation or an opening of all the capillaries. It also strengthens the arterial walls. So it's a remarkable herb and an excellent herb to use for anyone with heart problems. It can be used externally. And externally, it can be used wherever you want to increase blood supply to the area. So we've seen people who've lost feeling in their feet, peripheral neuropathy, uh, apply cane compressors to the bottom of their feet. And by morning, they're starting to feel pins and needles. People that have chronically cold feet where they mm -hmm. can compress overnight and find that by morning their feet are starting to warm. So what you've got to remember is what does cane do? It moves blood. It stimulates blood. So when you see stimulant, and I think that's what's put a lot of people off, mm. they're, they're likening it to, uh, to stimulants like uh, caffeine. So mm -hmm. there's the same pepper. It's a it's a remarkable herb. Yes, and I can testify as well that um, my mum has high blood pressure, and um, I think for a couple of years I tried to tell her about cayenne pepper, and she also has some stomach issues. So she was saying, "Oh, maybe I would have given it a try, but what about my stomach?" And I said, "It's not going to hurt you." No. So. Yeah, so no, maybe a couple of years. That, that is true. The, um, there's a couple of doctors quoted in that 10 pages from Back to Eden, and one doctor says it's impossible to abuse cane pepper, mm -hmm. and the other doctor says it will never cause a lesion. That means it will never burn. It will just heal. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, yeah. Um, after actually i think a couple of years even she used cayenne and i said put it under your tongue when your blood pressure goes up really high and she did that and she said wow it actually brought my blood pressure down <laughs> I'm like yeah and she also said um my stomach doesn't hurt because of it she said even grapefruit hurts my stomach but not cayenne yeah so that's also um great illustrations of finding out for yourself trying it mm -hmm. yeah that's right very good i have the book as well um back to eden by jethro claus i yeah. found it again amazing so what about um <clears throat> how do we make sure that we find the real cayenne barbara because i i find that you don't really see cayenne pepper under that um, botanical name capsicum anum is that something we should be looking for or well, I, I think that uh, the best place to buy cane pepper is from a herb company. Mm -hmm. And it should be a lovely bright red colour. If you buy cane pepper and it's a brown colour, that indicates it's quite old. Mm. Wow. Okay, very good. So what about the next um, also um, much debated um, issue, and that is of the soy. I have heard this. It's bad for uh, breast cancer because of the estrogen. Um, it's bad because almost 95% of soy is um, genetically modified. I've also heard there's no such a thing as soy. So basically God didn't make it. What are your thoughts on soy? Are there any benefits or it's actually bad for um, <coughs> breast cancer? Yeah, they're very good questions. And I have a girlfriend. In fact, she went through the nutritional course that we did together and mm -hmm. she did her thesis on soy. And she said when people ask her about soy, soy now, 
she's got a very simple answer. She said, God made it good, man mucked it up. <laughs> so in other words, if you can get non-GMO, organically grown soybean, it is a remarkable, it's a remarkable bean. And all mm -hmm. through Asia, it's been used for centuries. And did you know that through Asia, traditionally, there was not even a name for menopause because the women never suffered with menopause. And I read an interesting book called um, China Doctor, and it's the story of Dr. Harry Miller, who was a medical missionary in China, and I think it was in about the 1920s, uh, maybe even the late 1800s. And the book's out of print now. I was able to buy it. Um, Amazon found it for me. And, and a lot of little babies in China were dying. They couldn't handle the mother's milk. Of course, a lot of babies could, but there were some that couldn't. And so he wanted to find a milk that babies could drink. And he was on a ship one day and he saw this big vat of white milk in the kitchen. And he said, what's that? And it was soy milk. They were going to make tofu from it. So he mm -hmm. tasted it and he spat it right out. It was basically, <laughs> he couldn't bear the taste. And it was quite indigestible. So he, he went on a journey to make <clears throat> the milk digestible and palatable. And he came up with his soy milk. It was even to the point where his, his uh, colleagues were saying, it is not right for a doctor to be playing with a bean. <laughs> but he made this soybean milk. He found that he had to cook it. He found that he had to put a little oil and a little sweetener in, and he made quite a palatable milk. And it is said that he saved the lives of thousands of babies with his soy milk. Now, that soybean was not genetically modified that soybean was not grown with chemicals and mm -hmm. it, it is true that in especially in the u.s you know the majority of soybeans are called roundup ready because they've been genetically modified to resist roundup and a american farmer told me one day he said did you know that the field is sprayed five times before harvest that means that soybean not only has it been genetically modified which makes it difficult for the body to recognise and can even contribute to cancer. But it's got five doses. That's one, two, three, four, five doses of Roundup. And Roundup directly affects the hormones. So the soybean that can certainly contribute to breast cancer, any endocrine cancer, men or women, is that soybean. And it's not the... It's not the natural estrogen in the soybean, it's the, it's the chemicals on the soybean. Mm -hmm. There are some natural estrogens in the soybean, but they are so minor. And Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. And you could consider the soybean like that. So what these natural estrogens do in the soybean, they work with the human body. So if the cell is low in estrogen, the soybean will, the estrogen in the, in the soybean will go into the cell. But if it does not need it, the cell won't let it in. And so you can see by that illustration that the cell and the plants work together. It's called synergism. Or as the Bible says, God made herbs for the service of man. They're here to serve you. Whereas mm -hmm. the xenoestrogens, these are the estrogens from chemicals, from Roundup, from, from plastics, from all the polyester, the chemical fabrics. They just barge into the cell. They don't work with the cell. So we've got mm -hmm. a problem today and that is estrogen levels are rising um, because of people's exposure to chemicals and plastics. But not mm -hmm. the not the estrogen in the soybean. It works with the body. I've also heard that flax seeds have more estrogen, phytoestrogen, than soybeans. So it's, it's um, about it's about equal. But again, it's okay. that that type of estrogen that works with the body. Mm -hmm. But what I say to people that it hurts more the dairy industry than it hurts you. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and what they, claim, what they claim about the soybean <clears throat> can be applied to the genetically modified one 
prone with with uh, chemicals. Mm -hmm. Wheat in that case can be considered one of those dangerous foods in that case? Well, uh, not, not quite along the same line. Um, mm -hmm. Some people can handle wheat, but they can only handle it if they don't eat it three times a day. But the wheat mm -hmm. certainly has been changed. That is true. Mm -hmm. So in that case, Barbara, on that same note, um, would you advise a few of the, uh, I guess, good grains that we can use to make bread, for example, <laughs> which ones are not changed as much? Uh, spelt. Uh, spelt and Emma and Inkenhorn, they're, they're three wheats that have not been genetically modified or gone through intensive crossbreeding, um, hybridised. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. So next question is oil. I have mm -hmm. heard again other doctors, Christian doctors, um, doctors who believe in the Bible, um, natural methods of healing that they don't consider oil um, good food. Especially the debate is on coconut oil because it's considered a saturated fat and it can be good for heart health. And also I've heard this, that if you eat too much oil, then it comes out of your pores. If you have breakouts, that could be a result of using too much oil as well. What are your thoughts on oil and especially coconut oil? Okay, well... Before the, um, the, the COVID or the reaction to the COVID crisis on the planet, I used to go to Fiji every year. So I went to Fiji every year for probably 16 years. And in Fiji, in the South Pacific Islands, they've been using coconut oil for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And they, before white men came, they experienced peak health. No heart disease, no cancer, no diabetes, and they were eating coconut three times a day. So that illustration mm -hmm. in itself indicates that the problem is not the coconut. And coconut oil as a saturated fat is an excellent food. Saturated fat has got a bad name. You see, Ansel Keys, who was a research scientist from Minneapolis in 1953, he, per he first put forth the theory that saturated fat causes heart disease. But in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, he shows that there is no proof. He says, I'm still waiting for the proof. There is no proof that saturated fat causes heart disease. And so by about the 1980s, there was this big push to get people to stop eating butter because it's a saturated fat, it'll cause heart disease. Mm -hmm and try and get people to start eating margarine. So that, that started in probably about the 80s. So we're in uh, 2022 now. Did that reduce heart disease? Not at all. But what, what did happen is cancer rates rose because margarine is a chemical fat and our body does not recognize it. It causes great danger. In fact, it can even contribute to, to strokes and heart disease by damaging the arterial wall. Mm -hmm. No, saturated fat does not cause heart disease. The illustration I just showed you of South Pacific Islands is a living proof that that is not so. Mind you, today, their heart disease, their diabetes, their cancer, they're the same rates as ours because they've stopped eating their traditional diet with all the coconut and they've gone over to the white man's diet. We call it the SAD diet, the standard Australian diet, the standard American diet, which is... Uh, very high in refined foods, very high in um, in wheat and wheat products. Hot bread mm -hmm. shops abound in Fiji. I've even seen them open 11 o'clock at night. And so, and sugars, you know, there's huge ads for Coca-Cola everywhere. So it's the sugars and the, the high carbs and the altered fats that are causing the problem, certainly not the coconut oil. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to look at what the Bible says. What does the Bible say about oil? Well, I love the story and I read it often to my children about Elisha in the time, in the drought. And remember mm -hmm. God fed him, the ravens fed him. And then he went to a little village where a widow fed him for 
the rest of the time. And we know we know the Bible verse where where Elijah said to um, to the lady, he said, God has said that the oil will not fail nor the meal lack, or maybe it's the other way around, until the rain comes. Every mm -hmm. single morning she would go to her oil cruise and there was a little bit more oil in there. Now, who put it there? We know that mm -hmm. God put it there. And so God has sanctioned the use of olive oil. And then there's the other story, and this is Elijah too, where a lady's husband died and her sons had to be sold because she was in debt. They had to be sold as slaves. And she went to Elijah very <coughs> distressed about this. And he said, what have you got in your house? She had big oil jars. He said, get more oil jars. And do you remember the story? God filled every oil jar with olive oil. She was able to mm -hmm. sell the oil, pay off her debts, and her sons didn't go into slavery. Another illustration where God has sanctioned the use of olive oil. Now, absolutely, it is a concentrated food. We're not to drink cups of it a day, but I don't know anyone who even could drink a cup of olive oil. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't talk about coconut oil because where the Bible was written, you know, the coconut oil is not used. Mm -hmm. I think also the Bible um, says there is a verse that says uh, a bit of oil makes your face shine or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and that's not oil on the face. That's oil, eating oil and it comes out nourishing the yeah. skin. That's true. Mm -hmm. that's true and so we've looked at history we've looked at bible what about um scientifically so i'm a nutritionist and i've studied the science behind the oils and oil is an essential food group in the body the brain is the fattiest organ in the body the membrane around every single cell in the body is 50 percent protein 50 percent fat we need fat mm -hmm. and one of the most dangerous things about the oil-free diet is the effect on the brain <coughs> and god never never meant for the brain to deteriorate and unfortunately there's a lot of people with alzheimer's parkinson's dementia today has that got something to do with this oil-free diet mm. And one form of treating epilepsy is the ketogenic diet. They have, they've been using that since the 1920s with great success. And that is a diet that uses a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. And those and people don't die from heart disease. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, when it comes to brain health also, one thing we tend to stay away from is cholesterol. But isn't that how our brain is fed uh doesn't our brain need cholesterol to function well the brain loves cholesterol and the fact is mm -hmm. that uh 80 of the cholesterol that the body makes is made from glucose 20 percent is made from fat mm -hmm. so that you know and from his book the great cholesterol con that's what dr malcolm kendrick he says it it's a myth so the question is well what causes heart disease what causes heart disease is damage to the arterial walls, demanding that the liver make cholesterol to plug up the holes. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so the next question is about fermented foods. I have heard a lot. We have had this question a lot about fermented foods. Again, um, some of our doctors will say that it's not good because it's a result of sin. Fermentation is a result of sin. Um, they class kimchi, sourdough, miso in the same category as apple cider vinegar or wine. So what are your thoughts on that, Barbara? And are there any differences between wine and apple cider vinegar and kimchi and all these other fermented or cultured foods? Well, we know that wine must never be touched. We know that the alcohol kills brain cells and God has said not to touch it. And I don't. And I certainly appreciate what the Bible says about that. Apple cider vinegar, I don't have either. It is one stage short 
of alcohol. And we all, all have the illustration when the vinegar was given to Jesus, he, he refused it. Now, let me give you the science behind that. The apple cider vinegar is something that's called acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is a neurotoxin. And there are five places we can be exposed to acetaldehyde. One is vinegar. Another is alcohol. Alcohol breaks down in the liver to acetaldehyde, the neurotoxin. Also, we can be exposed to acetaldehyde from uh, cigarette smoke, from car fumes. And if someone has a yeast presence in their body and they're eating a lot of, a lot of glucose, even a lot of fruit, then as the yeast feeds on the glucose, it gives off acetic acid, lactic acid, uric acid and alcohol, which breaks down in the liver to acetaldehyde. So let's have a look for a moment at things like sauerkraut, um, kimchi, sourdough, miso. These are cultured foods and there's a big difference between cultured foods and fermented foods. Ellen White said, bread should be light and sweet, not heavy and sour. And a lot of people have read that and think she's talking about sourdough bread, but not so. Yeast bread yes. was only used from the Industrial Revolution. What's that, late 1800s, early 1920s, 1900s? Mm. Do you know what that means? Ellen White probably ate sourdough bread. Let's have a look what the Bible says about the sourdough bread. And I think it's 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, where the Bible says, No, you're not, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's your sourdough. You can have a little sourdough culture, put it into a big mix of flour and water, and it will leaven the whole lump. And also, you can find this in Luke, in one of Jesus' parables, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman that took a little leaven and put it in the meal till it leavened the whole lump. Let's look in the Old Testament and let's have a look at the children of Israel in the desert for 40 years and they were uh, celebrating the Passover once a year and for one week they had to put the leaven out of their homes. I ask you, what was the leaven? The leaven was the sourdough culture. I can imagine all these Israelite women with their little sourdough starter in a little clay bowl going and putting it under a a bush for a week and then after a week they'd come back and put a little bit of flour and water in and revive their culture. Let's have a look at the sourdough bread um, nutritionally. What it does, the sourdough, it breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain making it more digestible. So when you eat sourdough bread you're eating almost like you're eating pre-digested grain. Mm -hmm. That's really the only bread that I eat as a whole. If I do eat bread, it's the sourdough. So what about uh, sauerkraut? Well, let's have a look at nutritionally. Sauerkraut is a way of preserving cabbage. And when you have a look at where it's most popular would be in Germany. So in Germany, in the cold winter months of snow where they can't grow any cabbages, I'm sure that by the end of summer and they're harvesting a lot of their cabbages and some of them can be kept in the basement but some of them are made into sauerkraut where they finely slice it and they rub it and get the juice out. They put a lot of salt on it and little by little it begins to culture. So nutritionally, the sauerkraut is a, is a form of cabbage that has been cultured and in that culturing process, You've got a production of Lactobacillus acidophilus and, and Bifidus bacterium, and they are very important for the healthy function of the gastrointestinal tract. Also in the process of culturing the cabbage, the B vitamins are produced. So it's a, you get more B vitamins available in that. And so let's go over to Japan where miso has been made for centuries and they, they would culture the soybean, uh, the rice, the barley. And again, in that miso, it's a cultured food. So when you eat these cultured foods, you're getting some healthy bacteria for your, for your gut. Now, if it's mm -hmm. let go too long, if it's put into maybe a warm 
environment too warm, then fermentation begins. And when fermentation begins, alcohol's produced. And whenever the person smells or tastes that, they know they, they must discard it. Mm -hmm. That's very true. So you wouldn't recommend apple cider vinegar or wine or cheese, obviously, no. um, or pickles. Pickles can be classed in the same category, right? Well, it depends what the pickles are made with. If you make pickles mm -hmm. with salt and water, they can be quite good. If they're made with vinegar, not so. Yes. Very good. I hope that will answer a lot of other people's questions as well about cultured foods. Um, so what about compost, Barbara? Because that's obviously um, fermentation, that's rotting material. Um, should we be keeping compost bins in our houses? Should we try to stay away from the compost bins while we're making compost in well, our garden? The, the, um, we have three big compost bins in our garden and it's a long way from our house. The compost bin should be a long way from the house. It's the cycle of life. It's the cycle of microbes bringing matter back back to dust. And if you give the compost the right conditions, see what we do is we put a lot of garden scraps in. That's very heavy. And then we all we um, alternate that with weeds from the garden, especially the corn stalks, the broccoli stalks, and that that aerates it. That brings more of the um, aerobic bacteria. So if your compost is given the right conditions, um, it encourages more aerobic bacteria than anaerobic bacteria, and you get the breakdown of your, of all your, um, you know, your your matter. And I think, mm -hmm. and I know that you're going to ask me questions about um, growing our own food when uh, it's difficult to buy and sell, uh, the compost bins will be very important because mm -hmm. when we put compost into our garden, it can only go into the garden when it smells sweet. I was reading one book on the compost and it said in there that, that this master composter, he gets women to smell his compost because it should smell like sweet earth. If there is any bad smell, then the there's been too much uh, anaerobic bacteria. It can be aerated a little bit and go and have another look in a month and you might find by then it, it'll be brought back down to that sweet earth. So when you put the compost into your garden, you're putting microbes into your garden and it is the microbes in the soil that break down the minerals in the soil and make them available for the roots of the plant. Mm hmm so should we not be keeping little compost bins in our kitchen? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> they should be outside. <laughs> because I've bought one from Bunnings and then I think it's like a little novelty that a lot of people would think, oh, how cute, you know, I can just yeah. put some of the uh, scraps and so no. That's right. And again, there should be a, all, you know, alternating the heavy scraps with the light scraps some people mm -hmm. and the garden um, weeds and some people might go to the neighbor's cows especially if they're you know uh, organic farm and putting some cow manure in and maybe if they've got chooks or chickens they and they're the healthy mm -hmm. ones that don't um that don't have any chemicals given to them so what the compost does, and it's the microbes in the matter that's rotting down that converts it all back to dust. It's a mm -hmm. cycle of life. Yes, and your book has that as well, illustrated very nicely, self healed by design. Yeah. Yes, you explain quite well um, the cycle of life. <clears throat> So the next question is about uh, nutritional yeast. Uh, we have heard that it is MSG and it's got no place in whole food plant-based diet. We know that it can't be found in nature as vegetable or fruit, but what is your take on that? I don't use nutritional yeast at all. You cannot kill yeast. And as my book shows, The self heal by Design, that, you know, there's a lot of, information out today 
showing the link between uh, fungus, yeast and disease in the body. So I, I do not use it at all. Some say, but don't you need it for the vitamin B12? Well, in his book, Proof Positive, Dr. Neil Nedley, he shows there that you can be getting vitamin B12 from when you eat organically grown uh, root vegetables. It's mm -hmm. on an apple that you pick off the tree and eat because um, vitamin B12 is an airborne bacteria. And if your mm -hmm. gut is working well and your stomach is producing enough intrinsic factor, um, you will not have a B12 deficiency. So some people eat nutritional yeast because they say it's their B12 supplement. Um, monosodium glutinate, I don't advise we use it all. Uh, the, some of the names they give it today are natural flavor enhancer. So you have to be very careful to read, to read your labels. Mm -hmm. So uh, that brings us to the next question then. Um, and that is the question of mushrooms. Um, because it's a big substitute for meat for vegetarians. But the question is, is that even vegetarian? Is that even a vegetable? And um, is it a, a fungus and should be avoided? It is a fungus. And uh, I, I don't, I'm not absolute on, on that, that question. If someone has a yeast problem, if they are conquering their cancer, I don't advise them having mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, do I eat mushrooms? Not much. We actually don't serve it at our retreat at all. I don't usually buy them, but if I'm at someone's house for a meal and they have a dish with mushrooms, I'll eat them and enjoy them. They, they are a fungus. If you've got nice, strong hydrochloric acid and you don't have a yeast problem in your body, it's not really a problem. I don't think it be con should be considered a meat substitute. Our best meat substitute is the legumes, the beans. That's, that's an excellent source of protein. Yes. And um, when it comes to the hydrochloric acid, I've got a book, um, Natural Remedies Encyclopedia. And um, that book was also talking about hydrochloric acid, but I believe um, somewhere it says that um, you can have either too much or too little. Some of the indigestion is caused by either too little hydrochloric acid or too much. And um, obviously you said there's no such a thing as too much hydrochloric acid. And I was talking to actually uh, to a family member the other day that was wondering if she's got too much hydrochloric acid and it's burning her esophagus. She's having heartburn. What would you say uh, if a lemon is hurting them or something acidic is hurting them? What could be the cause of that? Um, if that is true, that tells me that the lining of the stomach is a little inflamed. Mm -hmm. And if someone's esophagus is feeling burning, it, it means that the little gateway from the stomach or from the esophagus through to the stomach, it's not working well because... There, there are two, there's a two layered valve right there um, from the esophagus into it. And the stomach acid should never come up. Mm -hmm. Why would it come up? Well, when people eat all day long, when people have their largest meal at the end of the day, then lie down to go to sleep, all of that can contribute to weakening that little valve. And that little valve called the, um, cardiac sphincter it sits right in the middle of our diaphragm and if someone has poor posture weak abdominal muscles that can also contribute contribute to that being weak and stress when people are stressed and their stomach you know their their muscles tighten that can open that uh, little cardiac sphincter and acid can come up mm -hmm. what often happens is if someone's hydrochloric acid is level as a low and the food's not getting digested quick enough, it can start to ferment and then that can come up through that, that little cardiac sphincter. So just remember, dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid that we do. They don't have heartburn. They don't have reflux. They don't have stomach ulcers. Uh, in fact, they, 
they digest meat very, very quickly. So if someone says to me, I've got too much hydrochloric acid, I say, fantastic, you must buy digesting your meal very quickly. <laughs> no, when, when lemon or acid things burn, that tells me that the lining of the stomach isn't as it should be. And the lining mm -hmm. of the stomach is about 99% water. So then you mm -hmm. would check that the person's well hydrated. And there's a herb called slippery elm. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. And when mm -hmm. that is taken, that coats and soothes the lining of the stomach. So that's a great way to heal that. Yes. And what about, I guess, lemon compared to antacids? Is that something we should be taking for the acid? Well, an antacid is a very dangerous thing because we need that acid to break down our protein. And if we don't have enough acid, our protein's not getting broken down and we can end up being protein deficient. Mm -hmm. Sorry, let me just wipe my nose. <laughs> I'm trying to be, <laughs> to be good <laughs> and ignore it. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me see. We've got a few, a few more questions. All right. So the next question, Barbara, how can God's people be healthy on a small budget and is being healthy only for the rich? Um, as we see the prices of everything are going up and it's very important for people to know how we can still eat in a healthy way and in a simple way as well. And when we don't have much money, obviously we can't afford to buy supplements and vitamins. So how can we make sure as we near the end of time that we are still healthy and according to God's ways of eating? Well, uh, the foods that are the highest in minerals, and minerals are very important, are dark green leafy vegetables. Now I'm in Scotland at the moment and I'm walking up hills and discovering wonderful little tracks on my morning walk every day so much stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is an incredible herb and the stinging nettle can be chopped up. You might want to put leather gloves on while you chop it up or chop mm -hmm. it up with scissors. But when you put it in soups or stews, it really increases the mineral content and the, the prickles limp so you don't get stung by it. Or you can dry it and then blend it to a powder and that can be taken like a green green barley supplement. It's a good idea to know your greens because there are so many wild greens out there that, that can be very beneficial. And yet, you know, that's free. I also encourage everyone to start with a small garden. If you haven't gardened before, start very small. That's what I did. I just started very small. And as I conquered one little patch, then I was brave enough to go a little bit further afield mm -hmm. and I do believe that uh, we will be seeing our food shortages in some places they're already being seen. I know in Australia mm -hmm. because of the restrictions on people coming into Australia we've lost a lot of our backpackers. Our backpackers are like young people with backpacks that travel and they used to do all our picking. They used to pick a lot of our fruit and vegetables and I was looking at one documentary where the farmer hoed all his watermelons back into the ground he couldn't get anyone to pick them so mm. you know these are these are very real situations and so growing our own food is very very important and using seed that can reproduce itself I know in Australia there are about mm -hmm. six different companies where you can buy non-hybrid seeds now, one of the cheapest foods, other than the greens that I just talked about, are legumes. Legumes are such cheap food. And when you soak it, you've got twice as many legumes. Mm -hmm. so I think it's, and they're an excellent source of protein. Some people say, what about the lectins? Yes, legumes mm -hmm. are high in lectins, but if they're well soaked, well rinsed, have a long, slow cooking or even a pressure cooking, that kills the lectins. So that's mm -hmm. not a problem. 
because lectins, if they get into your body, can certainly increase inflammation. So that's cheap food is the legumes. So grow as much as you can um, and uh, get to know the legumes. My first cookbook mm -hmm. when I was uh, first a vegetarian, which is probably 40 years ago now, was an Indian vegetarian cookbook. Now, the Indians know how to make legumes. There's so many different ways to prepare them. And they don't have mm -hmm. to be hot. I'm married to a man that does not like hot food. But we always <laughs> have cayenne pepper on the table if you'd like to make it a little bit warmer. So you, you can eat like kings and queens with uh, simple natural foods. And I found that when you sprout, you've got even more. <laughs> well, when you sprout, there's a few things with sprouting. One has to be very cautious that mould doesn't grow because it's a moist uh -huh. environment. And you will get more minerals, but you don't get more protein because it now comes back to a plant. My daughter in the US has been growing microgreens and she can mm -hmm. grow this in her in her house and they're, they're power packed they're like they're a sprout but I think a little bit older than a sprout mm -hmm. yes and that also I guess solves a lot of that um, lectin problem because I've heard that as well that well beans and nuts they've got lectin so it must be bad for you <clears throat> that they're only they're only no good if they're not prepared properly. When you cook mm -hmm. that, like in the sourdough, that kills the lectins. When you pressure cook, that kills the lectins. So it all depends how they're prepared. Mm -hmm. Very good. And also, I believe Jethro Kloss was talking about how soy is actually very good for the soil. So if you grow soy in your garden, that can actually feed the soil instead of depleting mm -hmm. it. That is true. Okay, so um, some of the end time preparedness questions. Um, we have heard different opinions about how we should be preparing but not hoarding. Can you please talk a little bit about um, how we should be preparing instead of hoarding, instead of that fear, um, but just um, meticulously prepare for the end times? How much is too much? I think the best way to um, prepare for the end times is uh, that we be right with God. And we know the promise where he says, bread will be given him, his water shall be sure. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we are um, ne neglectful in some preparation, but we don't know how it's going to turn out. We really don't know how, which is why I agree. I don't think that there is a need to make huge stores because we could be turned out of our homes, you know. With, um, we don't know how it will plan. But I think that to be wise, things like legumes store very well, but I know people that have had huge stores of them and then the weevils have got in them and they've had to, to you know, throw, throw out the lot. I think uh, we should have some stores in place, but uh, it needs to be with wisdom. And also the containers that they're they're stored in, I like to contain. I like to to use the containers that are made out of uh, glass or or metal, stainless steel. Mm -hmm. They certainly are, are are far superior. I don't like to store my foods in plastic. Also, mice and rats can chew, chew through the plastic. Oh yes. So I. I think the question should be, what will it happen? How will it happen? But how will we stand? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that we shouldn't be um, hoarding, obviously preparing crazy. Um, and Ellen White mentions as well that um, some of the Christians, as they saw the food, food prices going up, they started storing up food. And then when they went to check the food, they saw that they are worms in them yeah 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 so i guess um we should find that balance between that's right uh, preparing and um yeah that, that is hoarding. that is true that is true that is absolutely true and you know preparation for children it's not 
it's not a kind thing to be soft on your children. We, we do not know what is ahead. And it is far better that children get raised in homes where there's clear guidelines and there's consequences of, you know, of reward when they, they have done well. And there's also consequences if they have done wrong. And many children today are brought, brought up so soft, I think, how will they ever stand? How will they ever stand? Very important to prepare the children by teaching them to work at a very young age. And mm -hmm. when you don't teach your children to work, you deprive them of the joy of accomplishment. <laughs> it's a lovely mm -hmm. feeling that a child has when they have completed a task. So that's, that's some of the best preparations for the children. That's true. Okay, so what are some of the ways that we can preserve food and how can we be educated in that? You mentioned about the glass containers and metal containers. Is there anything else we can do in terms of preserving? I guess you, we talked about cultured foods as well that can last um, quite a bit. Are there anything else that we could be educated yes, in? And, and olives, but it all depends on where you live and what, what food is uh is available to you. Uh, I think it's important that we um, educate ourselves on how to uh, prepare and preserve food. What, one of the easiest ways to preserve food is drying. Mm. I know my daughter, she used to uh, do a lot of canning or bottling. She said it takes up so much room that and freeze, you know, you need big freezers. For, but she said drying is excellent. So mm -hmm. she, she has uh, gone to deer. She still does the, some freezing. She still does some um, canning or bottling, but she has found that the dehydrator, you know, it's very easy to store the dehydrated foods. Mm -hmm. And um, apart from making provisions for food, in what other ways can we prepare for the end times? Because I know that even Ellen White mentions that if we are not used to um, hunger, if we're not used to eating more simply and everything, we won't be able to endure the end times. So um, at the end times, I believe we won't have access to healthy foods and we won't have the choice. So how can we prepare, I guess, mentally as well? That's right. I, I uh, enjoy reading true stories about people who've been through the Holocaust, um, people who've been through tough times. I, I read an amazing story recently called The Seventh Day Ox about a guy who was in a Siberian work camp. You know, mm -hmm. when you read these stories and look at what these people have been through, they're, they're certainly inspiring. And I, I think what you say is true. I think it's important that we keep to the two meal a day plan. Um, some children need a little bit at night. Um, some people don't. I know my little grandson, when he stays with me, Lennox, he's only just turned four. Even an hour before the meal, he's struggling and he has drunk water. So half an hour before the main meal at lunch, I give him a carrot and he's able to nibble away on that. But, you know, different children, you feel your way with them. You always check whether they need a sleep, whether they need water, but I would never feed my children between meals. It, even with Lennox, I, I stretch it out and it takes him quite a while to eat that carrot and by the time he's finished it, then the, then the main, main meal is ready. And when a child mm -hmm. says, I'm starving, you know, they, they don't know what starvation is. And that <laughs> statement often cuts the mother's heart. It's, and if you yes. often you just have to distract them, sometimes they're bored. But I think mm -hmm. it's important in the home to keep to the the uh, five to six hours between the meals. And yes, to keep the meals simple. With my children, every breakfast always started with some raw fruit. And every lunchtime always began with some raw salads. Because I found that the children would hardly eat the fruit if the hot that was there. And the children would hardly eat the salad if the potatoes and the lentils appeared. So I would always begin the meal with the raw food. 
and then the children get a taste for the for the simple and the fresh. In fact, to the point we went to someone's house one day and there was no salad and my children looked at me and said, Mum, where's the salad? <laughs> because they they just weren't used to not having having salad with the meal. So I, I think it's important to keep it simple. We always had a dessert at um at birthdays, uh, we had a dessert often on the Sabbath, but we'd keep it to a very simple dessert. Mm -hmm. So what about mentally? How can we prepare mentally for the end times when we might not even have access to much food at all? What, what will keep us going? What will keep us going is our faith in God. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it is um, of the utmost importance that we prepare in these times and we prepare in these times by laying up God's word in our heart by memorizing Bible verses um, mm -hmm. by studying the prophecies studying the end time events and knowing that trouble is coming on the planet and um, how can we prepare and the Bible says in first uh, Thessalonians 518 in everything give thanks so now at no mm -hmm. matter what stage we're at god wants us to be thankful and when we're thankful we're basically saying father i don't like this i don't want this but i understand that out of this great things can happen i will learn things mm -hmm. that i would not have learned any other way and i have just read a story it's called the tattooist who was uh he was a tattooist in the in the um in the concentration camps in Auschwitz and wow just by reading these stories you know you get such an appreciation of what these people went through and mm -hmm. and you value you value what you have because these people were living so well and then all of a sudden everything was gone everything was gone mm -hmm. and he told his story as an old man he went into the concentration camps I think at about the age of 23 and he was in Auschwitz for three years and the lady that wrote out his story he said to her I wrote this for people to know so that it will not happen again and mm -hmm. I think what people a lot of people today they have forgotten what it's like I'm a fifth generation Australian, Scottish descent. I'm in my late 60s now. I have never known anything but freedom. My children have only ever known freedom. My grandchildren have ever, only ever known freedom. And I believe that it is helpful to read these accounts knowing that a time of trouble is coming on the planet such as we've never seen. Yes. And the devil likes us to think that all, all is well. And yet we know trouble is coming. We have a short respite right now. You know, we were locked down in 2020. There was a huge fear campaign, 2020, 2021. Now we're 2022 and there seems to be a relaxation. But the prophecy says it's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. so we know that, that more is coming. And so don't relax too much. Yes. Don't relax too much. A little time of peace, perhaps. Yeah. So when it comes to food, Barbara, you mentioned the simple food. What about, I hear this a lot about the food combinations. Ellen White says um, in one of her books, especially if you have um, feeble stomach, don't mix fruits and vegetables together. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Just because we don't have a feeble stomach, should we be mixing fruits and vegetables together or how should we combine food? Because I've heard this from church members as well that, well, Ellen White said, if you have a feeble stomach, so I don't have a feeble stomach, I should not <laughs> worry about that. Well, if you don't have a feeble stomach, and you keep combining the fruits and vegetables, <laughs> it soon will be feeble. <laughs> why? Why? Let me tell you why. Fruit is very high in sugar. It's high in fiber and it's low in minerals. Whereas the vegetables are high in fiber, they're high in minerals and low in sugars. And so they don't mix very well together in the stomach. Now, there mm -hmm. is a 
class of, the, of fruit that is what we call the savoury fruit. So even though they've got the classification of fruit, which is the seed in, in the article, they are mm -hmm. savoury fruits. So we look at them that they can go either way. So that's the tomato, the avocado, the lemon, the eggplant, zucchini, cucumber, squash or pumpkin and aubergine. And so they, that class of vegetables really can go either way. Now, it's not the odd day you do it or the odd day you don't. It's really what you do every, every day that determines it. So sometimes after a main meal, we'll have an apple pie, my husband's favourite, <laughs> after a vegetable meal. But that doesn't happen every day. In fact, I'm travelling at the moment. It's not happening at all at the moment. So it's not the odd day you might mix a few together, but it's basically what you do every day that, that determines it. Um, you mentioned apple pie, Barbara. It just reminded me of cinnamon. Um, do you recommend using spices or um, we should not be using spices, only herbs? How do you differentiate between those? That's right. So now we have to to determine what is a spice. A spice is an irritant. So what are the irritants? Mustard is an irritant. Black pepper certainly is an, is an irritant and they, they should never be taken. Personally, I don't use cinnamon, but if someone makes a baked rice pudding and puts a half a teaspoon of cinnamon in it and 10 people are gonna eat that pudding, to me, that's not a big deal. But mm -hmm. to take a teaspoon of cinnamon, that's that gets to the point of irritation. Mm -hmm. so what mm -hmm. I use instead of cinnamon now is coriander, and that gives a very nice flavour. Okay, that's true. So what about black pepper? I've heard that it enhances um, turmeric's um, benefits for the body. Is that true? Should we be taking black pepper with turmeric? It is true, and so I wanted to know why. The uh, Proverbs 14 verse 6 says, knowledge is easy to him that understands. We, we need to know why. Why does it enhance it? It's because it contains a plant chemical called pepperine. Well, cane pepper contains pepperine too. Okay. So you, and yet I don't use black pepper because it is an irritant. And I was also mm -hmm. reading in a agricultural magazine that every single peppercorn they tested dried peppercorn had fungus in it so it, it seems that the black pepper um, develops fungus very easy as it's drying okay uh, the same thing i've heard about um, vanilla bean as well that it's impossible to um, make the vanilla bean that we have today without fermenting and um, without the process of rotting somehow? Well, we need to understand that there's culturing, there's fermenting and there's rotting. You know, rotting is when something goes bad. But when you culture, it, it's not bad. It actually enhances the nutrients mm -hmm. and the digestibility. And the other thing is how much vanilla do you use, you know? I might put a little vanilla in a in a pear cream I'm making with cashews. I might put half a teaspoon and it's going to feed 10 people. That's hardly anything. Mm -hmm. Very true. Okay, so what advice do you have for people that are anxious about the future? As we see food prices going up, rumours of food shortages are circulating. My suggestion is don't stress get a good fork and shovel and start digging a garden. <laughs> mm -hmm. And remember that God has promised that he will not take us through anything that we will not be able to cope with. But with that temptation, we'll make a way of escape that we will be able to bear it. God has given us today and we are to thank him for this day. We're to thank him for everything that happens to us this day. And tomorrow we'll get another day. So, and, and God said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, he says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. 
And a sound mind assesses the situation and says, we have no need to fear because we serve a mighty saviour. He says in John 16, 33, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but he says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So you see, when you love God and you serve him and walk in his ways, we're on the winning side. Amen. Amen to that. So thank you very much, Barbara. I'm sure we all were very blessed with all those answered questions. Um, we kept getting these questions and um, everyone wanted to know what you think about them. So it was a blessing. Thank you so much. And can we ask you to close with a word of prayer, please? Certainly. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you that you've chosen us to live on planet Earth right now. We thank you that you're coming soon. And we pray that each one of us will come close to you, to learn more of you, to do everything we can to love you with our whole mind, our whole heart and our whole strength and to love each other as ourselves. Father, thank you for what you have done for us, what you have promised to do for us and thank you for the mansions you are preparing for us. May we be faithful is our prayer in the in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again, Barbara. God bless your ministry. And thank you so much again for your time. It's my pleasure. Bye-bye, Cersei. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Please like, subscribe, and share our presentations with those who will benefit from them. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, and on Signal as well. If you have any questions, please email us on takechargeofyourhealth101 at gmail.com. If you want to know more about Barbara O'Neill, please watch our previous presentation, What Should a Christian Wear? There is a lot of information about Barbara O'Neill, about how and why she was banned, and how she is able to still practice and help a lot of people as she travels around the world. God bless and see you all next time.